Well, good evening and welcome to Café Scientifique, uh, Silicon Valley at SRI International, our long full name. I'm Alice Resnick, SRI's Vice President of Corporate and Marketing Communications and a member of the Café's Advisory Board. So welcome Café newcomers and I see a lot of familiar faces, so welcome to our regulars and some SRI staff members and alums as well. Uh, if you'd like to um, watch past events that you might have missed or not seen, we post them on SRI's YouTube channel, and the URL for our YouTube channel is um, printed on a bookmark you can pick up on your way out this evening. So tonight we're going to visit the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, which SRI has operated for the National Science Foundation since 2011. And you may recognize this unique facility from a couple of movies. Uh, Jodie Foster was in the movie Contact. And uh, the facility was also used for the James Bond film Golden Eye. More than 100,000 people visit the facility each year, including about 30,000 students. And I had the opportunity to visit the facility last year. And um, sometimes you really do find some creatures from space there. Um, so tonight, um, Dr. Robert Kerr, a director of the observatory, was our scheduled speaker. He had an unexpected last-minute change of plans, um, and we're very fortunate, though, to have Dr. Anthony Van Eiken presenting this evening. Tony is deputy director of SRI's Geospace Center, and he, too, is very intimately familiar with uh, the observatory. Tony's a renowned expert in incoherent scatter radar, which is one of the very powerful research tools that are used at the facility. Uh, prior to joining SRI in 2009, Tony directed the European Incoherent Scatter Scientific Association, which conducts research at three facilities north of the Arctic Circle. Tony's also held teaching and research positions at uh, several universities in the UK and in Norway. Um, Tony's going to speak for about an hour, and when he's done, um, he will take questions from the audience. And since we're recording, we'd really appreciate it if you'd use uh, microphones. That'll be set up in the aisles. So thanks very much and uh, for being here, and let's welcome Tony to the podium. Okay, thank you, uh, Alice, for the introduction. <coughs> oh, excuse me, I brought a frog with me. Um, so uh, Bob Kerr, who uh, was supposed to be here and give this presentation, uh, uh, unfortunately has an appointment with a surgeon tomorrow morning. And uh, so can't be here, that's on the East Coast. Uh, and he sends his apologies and uh, best wishes to all of you. And he's also uh, sent me his slide stack. And so um, I have adjusted the stack of slides a little bit. I've added a few bits and pieces and taken a few things out. Uh, but in the way of disclaimers in the front of books, all the good stuff is his and all the mistakes are mine. <laughs> uh, and in particular, um, I, um, in going through his slide stack, I've been upset a number of times by the slide changes. So if I sort of suddenly stop and mid, mid, whatever, then I'll, I'll catch up with myself. Um, so we're uh, going to talk about uh, 50 years of out-of-this-world research um, at Arecibo. Arecibo is 50 years old uh, uh, about two months ago, three months ago, so a little, little bit over 50 years now. Um, it is an iconic facility, and I, I'll tell you something about how it was constructed and why it was constructed, uh, and I'll show you some of the things that it, that it does. So um, Bob was going to talk to you about history uh, and present activities and the future. And I'm going to stick pretty much to that. Uh, this picture here is a, professor of Bill, uh, a picture of Bill Gordon, uh, who is the sort of father of Arecibo. He's the guy who had the idea and uh, pushed through its construction and was its first director. Uh, it passed away uh, last year um, after a long career in this, in this field. Uh, I asked one of my colleagues, uh, who hasn't been to Arecibo but knows about it, um, what's the... Uh, important things about Arecibo were to, in his mind. And he said, it's in the movies, <laughs> uh, as Alice already mentioned. Uh, and he said, it's cool engineering. And it is, you know, it's huge, and I'll, I'll say something about that. And finally, he said, it's a mistake. 
And actually, it really is. And I'll explain to you why it's a mistake. And I'll explain to you why you all want to make mistakes like this. So um, Arecibo, uh, it's the biggest radio telescope in the world. And uh, big hardly really uh, explains the size of this thing. That dish is close to 20 acres. That means it's around a third of the total area of this SRI campus. Um, it is a, a vast thing. And uh, in this sense, big is really better. Because the bigger your collecting surface area, everything else being the same, the more signal you can get in. So the more sensitive you are, or correspondingly, the quicker you can make an observation. And so I'm going to compare it here with a few of the big radio telescopes in the world. So Green Bank, over uh, in the, on the east side of the country, is a 300-foot dish. Arecibo is nine times bigger than that, nearly an order of magnitude bigger. Now, an order of magnitude in this business is real significant. I mean, think of it in terms of housing around here. You know, you can buy a, what, a garage for a million pounds around, a million dollars around here. Well, factor of 10, you could buy a garage for $100,000. That's getting good, isn't it? Uh, it's nine times bigger than Effelsberg, the German telescope. It's 16 times bigger than Jodrell Bank, the Mark I uh, Isaac Newton telescope in the UK. It's 44 times bigger than the big dish, the Stanford dish that you probably all know up the hill here. <laughs> Uh, and it's even a lot bigger than the many of the, of the synthesis arrays. So it's uh, about a factor of five bigger than the, the VLA in, in New Mexico. So this is huge. I also want to give you a feel for the scale of this construction. This is the, the feed structure that is suspended above the dish. It's about 450 feet above the surface of the dish. And it weighs close to 1,000 tons. Uh, it's suspended a bit like a bridge. So there are three pylons around the dish that's supported on cables. Um, and to give you a notion of the size, those are some people up there. Here's a little expanded piece of that. Uh, and not only that, but it moves. Um, so um, this curved structure here, uh, these two feeds move back and forward along that track. And that whole thing goes around on the circuit of track there in order to point the telescope. Um, so it's been operational since the beginning of November 1963, so that's it's 50 years. It's managed by SRI since, uh, for the last two years. Prior to that, right from its inception, it was built and operated by Cornell University, who did wonderful things with it that we're uh, trying to, to continue in the same vein. And it's used for research in atmospheric science. That was actually what it was built for. Uh, in astronomy, which is what it's mainly known for and in planetary science, active radar planetary science. And I'm going to show you something about all of those. So let's go and talk about history. And uh, I said that this thing was a mistake. Uh, Bill Gordon, um, in the late 50s, this is the height of the Cold War and, and all of those things, was thinking about how could you uh, make measurements of the upper part of the atmosphere. So you know, from 100 miles up and, and higher than that, there really was no way to get there. The space age hadn't really started. Uh, Sputnik just about appeared. Um, and there were sort of swept frequency sounders that could look at the bottom side of the ionosphere, but that was about it. There was really no way to make observations up there. And so he started thinking, how could, how could we do that? And he realized that actually radars had become sufficiently powerful as a result of development in the war, and the receivers had become sufficiently sensitive that actually you could imagine to get an echo from the free electrons in the ionosphere. And so uh, I'm going to give a very, very quick bit of introduction to incoherent scatter, uh, this, this process of, of trying to echo, get echoes from electrons in the upper part of the atmosphere. So this is, this is um, a process that we uh, transmit a very powerful signal. And uh, for this sort of business, we're talking about uh, effective radiative powers in the, in the small numbers of tens of gigawatts. So an enormously powerful signal goes up into the ionosphere, up, up. 100 miles above your head or so, it's a pretty good vacuum. There is some residual gas up there. A few percent of that residual gas is, is ionized mainly by solar ultraviolet light. So you've got some free electrons and ions up there, um, but only a few percent of almost nothing. So there's very little target up there to scatter off. And you know that the uh, classical radius of an electron is 10 to the minus 28 of a square meter, so really, really tiny. Um, if you think, think of a typical radar which, where the beam is spreading, so maybe 100 kilometers away, it's about, uh, about a kilometer across, and we're kind of gating the signal, so perhaps a kilometer long. If I take all the ionosphere in that sort of space, about a kilometer around, I squeeze it all together, I'm going to end up with a total scattering cross-section about the size of a full stop on a printed page. So 
something really very small. And we're trying to observe that sort of echo at ranges of one, two, three, four, five hundred miles or more. So this is a, a, a business of requiring a huge amount of power and very sensitive receivers. Um, the, the receive signal is, is noise-like, so we have to do a lot of signal processing on it. Uh, but here's an example of, of what one of these radars looks like. So uh, here's the spectra in gated in, in range up here in kilometers from about 100 to 350 kilometers. And here shown as a, as a color plot. And you can see the whole signal is shifted towards higher frequencies here close into the radar. This is actually a radar up in the Arctic looking at uh, plasma convecting across the pole towards it. And so that is actually plasma rushing, rushing towards the radar and you can use it to, to show what the ionosphere is doing over whole days. So Gordon realized this and he said, okay, got his back of the envelope out and did his calculations and said, in order to do this, we're gonna need a dish which is a thousand feet across and there Arecibo was born. Um, and so uh, here's a, a thousand feet across, the, the uh, feed structure 400 and some feet above it. Uh, it isn't actually a parabola, it, it's a, a spherical dish and I'll come back to that uh, in a bit. Um, and the reason that it was a mistake was that uh, while he was busy building this, other people who didn't read the same physics books actually went out and tried it, and they found that they could indeed get a scattered signal with a very much smaller dish. And so perhaps he really didn't need a thousand feet across, but it was a wonderful mistake, and I wish I could make mistakes <laughs> like that. Um, and uh, actually, they realized very early on that this would be a wonderful device for, for radio astronomy just because of that enormous collecting area, uh, which is unrivaled uh, even today. And so uh, I'm going to show you some of the, the uh, construction of, uh, and the history of, of how this thing was put together. Um, we'll just touch, you know, why, why is it on the equator? Well, they realized uh, early on that they would want to be able to do uh, radar studies of, of uh, other planetary objects, of other planets and asteroids and so on. And in order to do that, you want to be close to the equator so that you have good coverage of the sky. And so anything that crosses the ecliptic has to pass through your, your field of view. And it turned out that in Arecibo, you had this wonderful cast geography. So this is looking down on the top of the dish. And you see uh, this um, whole area is riddled with uh, uh, caves, really big caves, river, river caves, many of which have, uh, in, in geological past, collapsed, leaving uh, depressions in the ground, which are very close to the shape we want. And so Bill Gordon reputedly flew over this area in a helicopter and said, that's the one. And uh, they duly threw out the poor farmer who was in residence there and built a dish. And they had to do a little bit of um, maneuvering of the, of the shape in order to make, it, uh, to make it fit. And so this is looking down on the, on the dish. Uh, here's the support structure in the middle, uh, the feed structure in the middle. There's its shadow on the edge of the dish. And there are three towers, one here, one here, and one here. And so, as I said, it's like a suspension bridge. So there are, there are multiple cables suspending this thing here. They're under enormous tension. Um, they say that if it were to freeze in Puerto Rico, which fortunately it doesn't, and so the cables would shrink, that they'd snap. Um, when you go and stand on this platform, I showed you the picture of the people walking around up there, you really can't feel that it's suspended from anything. It feels rock solid. And, and actually, there's one other thing that I should say in mentioning to that, that um, when you have this huge platform suspended above the dish on these, these cables, it has some equilibrium position. But actually, as the sun comes up and the cables warm and so on, you know, they expand and so the thing goes up and down. Uh, and we really don't want it to do that. We want it to stay at a fixed position above the surface of the dish. In fact, we want to stay within about a millimeter of where we would like it to be relative to the dish. And so this is kind of crazy, but if you go out and you stand under the dish and you hook a cable and you start pulling, uh, then obviously you'll be able to move the whole structure down and, uh, and then by servoing that, that, uh, that winch that you're using to pull it down, you can maintain its position and so you, you laser range it and uh, as the sun comes up and the cables expand and so on, you let off some of the tension, it goes up a bit and light comes down again and so on. So we're actually controlling the position actively over the surface of the dish. Um, so this is going back to, to the original construction. So um, here in the middle of this picture, you can see this little farm. I think that they were growing tobacco there and I have no idea what happened to the poor guy who was there. But uh, it was obviously a shock to his system. So. And uh, they did this really quickly uh, with a budget of about $9 million, which is quite amazing when you think uh, what it would cost to do this today. So in three years, they went from the proposal to being done and operating. And today, we would probably still be doing the environmental surveys or maybe, <laughs> maybe the paperwork to do with starting the environment. You know. 
Uh, so uh, initially they built the towers and put the cables up and then they started to construct the, the feed system on the ground below that and, and winched it up into place and then eventually built the dish underneath it. And so uh, this is uh, uh, August 1963, just before it became operational. And the dish was originally a mesh surface, so you can see right through it and you can see the roads uh, run, uh, running underneath it. Um, there is some residual of the, of the river that caused that cave. Um, and so actually they have to pump water out of the bottom of this depression all the time. Um, and it's the tropics, so it rains like crazy from time to time and occasionally it overwhelms the pumps and it begins to flood down there. Uh, not to the extent that the James Bond film showed it, but anyway. Um, now, I said that the dish was, was, was uh, spherical and not parabolic. So a parabolic dish brings all the incident radiation in a particular direction to a point focus where you put your receiver. Uh, in a, a spherical dish, that's, that's not true. And uh, so this is the same uh, sort of caustic that you see here in your empty cup of coffee or, or whatever that... Uh, in, indeed, it brings it to a line focus here. Um, now, there's a really good reason why you would do this. It, I mean, it's a real hassle because you've got a line focus rather than point focus. But you can't steer the whole main dish of Arecibo around. Now, in the case of a, of a parabolic reflector, there is one specific focus. In the, point of, uh, in the case of a spherical reflector like this, there are many areas, many points that work just the same. So the, the dish is, is identical to them. And that's why you have that feed structure at the top, so you can move around your point of illumination of the dish or your point of focus of the dish. And by that means, you can steer the, the beam uh, within about uh, a little less than 20 degrees of the zenith in, in any direction. Um, but it did mean that they uh, need to feed it with a line feed. And so this is the original line feed, um, or maybe it's a, an iteration. I think they had trouble with the first line feed, so this is the later version of the line feed. But for the original 430 megahertz transmitter, which was for incoherent scatter. And it's still there, and it's still the main instrument that we use for, for the incoherent scatter radar. Um, all the uh, uh, transmitter equipment and the control room and so on went into this building, so this is the transmitter hall. This is the control room looking out the dishes down here, so it looks out over the dish. Uh, there's electronics labs and so on in the space behind here, and then this is a, an office block uh, for, the, for the scientists and the users. And it's all kind of um, sort of rather utilitarian, semi-military type structure, I guess, from the, from the Cold War area in which it was built. The original 43, 435 megahertz transmitter, 430 megahertz transmitter is still in use today. It's been upgraded, of course, along the way, but the control panel for it is still the same. So this is 50 years old, and it still works great. 